My mother warned me never to make an enemy of a witch. The Brigmore Witches, the follow-up to Dishonored's first piece of DLC, The Knife of Dunwall, starts with a stark reminder that Dowd's life is quickly coming to a close. When Corvo appears in your dream, during the opening section of the game, you almost definitely die to him. Unless you're seriously fast and aggressive, you won't stand a chance. Regardless of what happens in the dream, it's another typically dreary day for Dowd. His crew, the Whalers, don't trust him like they used to. The location and layout of his home is known to all of his enemies, his protege Billy Lurk will never be seen again, and he's getting ready to head to Cold Ridge Prison to bust out one of the most violent psychopaths in all of Dunwall. Even if you played the previous DLC entirely pacifistically and didn't touch a hair on a single head, it's impossible to not feel surrounded by death and despair during this first section. You can practically smell Doubt's fate in the air. Taking prisoners is exactly the sort of thing I'm talking about. You don't have to remind me. It's Billy's doing that the Overseers found us. That wasn't Dowd. Dowd should have caught it. And now witches. He's not the man he was. Quiet. You're going to get us killed. Dowd. Ever vigilant, I see. Are we leaving soon to Brigmore? Interesting times, gentlemen. Overseers in the flooded district. Witches abroad in the city. Traitors in the ranks. I'd be nervous, too. Then I'd remember who killed the Empress in Dunwall Tower, and came out untouched. One way or another, he and his crew won't be around this time next year. This, combined with that fantastic opening dream sequence, does a great job of reminding you why Dowd is doing what he's doing. On some playthroughs, it might be a way of begging to the outsider in hopes that he saves you from your fate. On others, it's to die with a shred of dignity. But either way, Dowd is swimming in a sea of blood, and he needs a ship. That's where Lizzie Stride, captain of the Dead Eels, comes into play. She's locked up at Cold Ridge Prison, and seeing as she's a violent, murderous pirate, it's telling that she's the only person with a boat that Dowd can trust. This mission starts with a very serious challenge, as well as a reminder of some of the game's mechanics. The prison is surrounded by a barrier of sorts, the music boxes. Ever since a recent incident with a witch inside the prison's walls, this place has been upgraded to blast the magic nullifying music all across its perimeter. No heretics in, no heretics out. This is, of course, a problem for Dowd. One solution is to pony up a handsome fee to get yourself an overseer outfit. This overseer was tasked with diagnosing and treating a potential curse that was put on the prison in the interrogation room. They'll let you in the front door, past the wall of music, and straight to the interrogation room, where some options open up to you. But if paying your way in isn't your style, and you'd rather remain undisguised, you might find this route to the courtyard while waiting for the guards blocking your way to finish their conversation, netting you an opportunity to interrupt the execution of the guard who helped Corvo escape, who will tell you which cell Dizzy Stride is in. And yes, the cell she's in is in fact randomized. Alternatively, if you're really bold, you can hop onto this bridge, blinded of intel through your inability to use Void Gaze out here, and sneak past this first guard, maybe using a bottle to distract him so that you can get a few yards past the front gate and past the area where the music nullifies your magic, allowing you to blink past him. From there, it's a pretty simple matter of just blinking from rafter to rafter, taking in the sights and sounds of Cold Ridge Prison once again, and gathering intel. Anyways, regardless of how you get through these first couple of checkpoints, you'll pick up on some pretty useful intel. The Arc Pylon in this section is disabled if you're disguised as an Overseer, and on top of that, you might come across this stash up here. A prisoner was planning to take these supplies and make a break for the gate, jumping off the bridge and swimming into the sewers, just as Corvo did. However, if you listen to these two guards out here in the beginning, you'll note that they specifically drained this water lock to prevent this escape method from being used again. By stealing these supplies, we're saving a life. He would have jumped straight to his death, blinded by the night. Anyways, as we clear out this prison room by room, odds are you'll end up checking on that witch that you've been hearing about since you got in. Something crazy happened in the interrogation room. That's the whole reason the overseer you might be disguised as was dispatched to this place. The rune in here will likely get you into this room on any playthrough, so it's as good a place to start this discussion as any. In the interrogation room, we see just what happens when you make an enemy of a witch. After a hit to a kneecap from the torturer, this witch killed both the guards in here and destroyed the whole room with her magic. That explains the Overseer music playing outside, and it might even explain the charred corpse that we see at the bottom of the riverbed. Either way, it's a good reminder of just what sort of power we're up against. In terms of raw magical ability, every single one of these witches might just be even more powerful than Dowd. 
But that's pretty much the only piece of narrative important side content here, unless you count saving the guard who helped Corvo escape. Which, let me just say, it is a fantastic detail that these guards fall right here when executed, should you choose to not try and save them, when it's very likely that you'll be hiding in this spot. Anyways, this first mission, like the first mission of the previous DLC, serves to get you reacquainted with your Dishonored skills by giving you a few somewhat isolated stealth challenges. You've got rooms to navigate, you've got keys to steal, you've got intel to acquire. Those first two are self-explanatory, the latter is a bit more interesting. Maybe you get the intel from the guard who saved Corvo, maybe you got it from the logbook in the guard room, maybe you just searched each prison cell with void gaze or good old fashioned line of sight, but eventually you figure out which cell Lizzie strides in, and by this point, you'll have certainly overheard or discovered the fact that cell doors are now all controlled from one room as a response to Corvo's escape with the smuggled key. Heading there, it's easy enough to just enter in the door code for Lizzie, pick her up, and head out the way you came in. However, whether it was during your search for her, your trip to her cell, or your trip away from her cell, you'll definitely come across something in one of these other cells that piques your interest. Maybe it's this corrupted bone charm in this cell. Maybe it's the mysterious note you found in the interrogation room, saying that there's some experimental blend of choke dust in A25. Maybe it's the Hatter who begs you to let him out. Maybe it's this prisoner saying he'll kill the guard outside of his cell if he ever gets out. A useful distraction, or even an ally. And hey, there's even one prisoner who recognizes you and will tell you how to get to Lizzie if you recognize his Hatter outfit and accordingly lie, saying that you're here to kill her. Maybe you just want to create some chaos and open each cell one by one, letting every prisoner run free just to thin out the guards a little bit and ruin some people's days. Regardless of your reasons, it's going to be pretty tempting to start opening some cells, and that's when you might remember your new power, Pool. Using this power, you can grab a bit of loot from a ton of different cells without ever having to go through the trouble of opening them. You can move Lizzie's body from point A to point B with ease. You can even pull the whale oil out of this arc pylon, giving you a useful explosive attack against the guards below on a combative run. Ultimately, there are six key notes that are hit by this mission, each one very deliberate. One, it reminds you that Corvo was skilled enough to escape this place without any magical powers, and that it's your fault that he had to anyways. Corvo's coming for you, and he's good, and you deserve it. Two, it reminds you of just how powerful these witches are. Three, it reinforces that Dowd is such a scumbag that the only smuggler he can trust is one of the most violent psychopaths in Dunwall. Four, it reminds you that it's totally worth sticking to the high ground, listening to what guards are saying and really planning things out accordingly, as well as more basic stuff, like what Overseer music does, what our pylons are. Remember, this came out nearly four months after the previous DLC, and not everybody is going to be replaying these games as much as I do. Five, it reminds you that there are often dozens of ways to go about your mission. I mean, hell, in the hour I spent replaying this mission, I came across five different ways to find Lizzie Stride's cell, one of which I didn't even know about. And six, it tutorializes the hell out of the pool ability in a totally natural way that still asks for a bit of thought from you, the player. This mission is intense. It isn't that difficult. Hell, it's probably the easiest mission in the whole game, DLC and base game included. But it accomplishes so much with such a small amount of space, it's really something special. The recontextualization of a previously used environment is so strong here. I mean, who didn't want to run through Cold Ridge Prison with their magical powers after replaying the base game and finding themselves stripped of their abilities in that first mission? Anyways, we got our boat, and we got our captain. Time to figure out what the catch is. Lizzie wound up in prison because of a mutiny in her gang, the Dead Eels. Edgar Wakefield, Lizzie's old second-in-command, has taken control of the Dead Eels, and he won't give it up without a fight, not even to Lizzie. And if that wasn't enough, the Hatters stole something from the Dead Eels to get their textile mill up and running again, and whatever it was, it started a full-on war between the two gangs, and your spies have reported strange sightings of figures watching them from the rooftops, just out of the corner of their eyes. In my eye, this mission has four goals that it's trying to fulfill. Firstly, it of course needs to establish the story of the level. The gang war, the Dead Eels coup, the abandoned and then repurposed aristocratic shopping district, the textile mill, the why and how of these strange figures watching you, and all the other little pieces of lore that go into making this feel like a real place. Secondly, it's trying to make us remember just how much we hate Delilah Copperspoon. The last level reminded us of how strong the Coven of Witches is with that torture room scene. Now we need more of that will to go after her in spite of the danger. Thirdly, it doubles down on the lesson of the previous level. In that first mission, we are told that Lizzie is a violent lunatic, and that it's telling that she's the only person that Dowd can trust, but now that she's out of prison, we have to see that for ourselves. Hopefully, the effect of this will be the player thinking about how bad a person Dowd is, making us want to redeem him that much more. 
Fourthly, I believe that this is trying to be the most diverse, replayable mission in the game. So we'll need to be able to take a dozen different routes, make a bunch of meaningful decisions, see things play out in a ton of different ways, and find critical intel from a bunch of different sources. Let's see how well it achieves this lofty set of goals. We start out strong with the world building. As soon as we enter this street, we're forced to hide or intervene in a little skirmish between the two gangs, surrounded by advertisements for fine clothes, discarded spools of surplus fabric from the once defunct textile mill, large, expensive-looking apartment buildings on all sides, Hatter's Gang graffiti all over the place indicating that this half of the town is their turf. Spend 30 seconds just looking around this starting area, and a pretty clear story starts to form. And hell, if that wasn't enough for you, you can listen in on the shouting match that precedes this skirmish, and hear that the Dead Eels are specifically looking for someone from the Hatters called the Geezer. Moving forward, I face the same problem I face with almost every level, covering a good chunk of the environment smoothly when talking about a totally non-linear environment. Well, with most playstyles, it's hard not to start with a bit of recon, so you probably wound up sticking to the rooftops. This is one of the only missions in both DLC where the rooftops generally feel pretty safe. So between that fact, the framing on this first route, this alternative route, and the bone charm up here, I'd say you're pretty likely to end up on this roof here, watching another gang fight below, taking note of the dead eels on this rooftop across the canal, and the shopping plaza turned Hatter gang hideout below you. You can go ahead and handle the Hatter Gang hideout now if you want to, maybe use pull to get the key to the whale oil tank from this wall of light, maybe sneak in with a rewire tool and kill them both, maybe just hit them with a good old fashioned choke dust sleep dot combo. You could grab a whale oil tank or some other explosive, or hey, maybe you just walk right past them. Either way, you see that you aren't getting into the Hatter's territory without knowing the password. This might remind you that that isn't your objective anyways. You need to meet up with the dead eels, and to do that you'll have to cross the street. Crossing the street feels pretty dangerous. The ground level is outside of the range of your void gaze, you're out of luck in terms of high up areas to move to, the survivors of that first brawl are still up the street, on the far end of the canal you've got a dead eel camp where they're just watching out towards you. It really isn't that populated, but with this tree blocking your way, you have no way of knowing that, and the safest way to proceed becomes just blinking past the dead eel's view and into the canal below. It's just as well that you go this way, because one of the favors you can pay for during your mission prep is to have a rune dropped off at this location. Whether you get the rune in the canal or not, you'll be hard pressed not to notice these two hatters trying to crack open this safe over here. Taking them out is no problem, it's just two of them, but then you're right where they were. If you're like me, you're going to cast a void gaze to see if there might be any keys nearby. There aren't, but you'll see that there's a gold bar waiting for you in this safe if you can get it open. And you might see that this Oxrush flower down here is actually shown to doubt as a valuable in Void Gaze. We aren't sure why yet, but I'm sure we'll find out soon. Well, heading to the other side of the canal, deciding what to do with these two, and making your way into the open window reveals that these flowers are apparently priceless to any alchemist. We also find a black market seller who can hook us up with a bone charm, as well as some more ammunition and elixirs. Moving a bit further down the roofs of this alleyway, we can take down those two dead eels who were giving us some grief earlier, and find this memo that one of them wrote. Right across the street, one of the guards saw a lady standing on the rooftops, and she left some sort of thing in her place when she left. Must have been the bone charm that we picked up earlier. Our first clue. There are witches here. Lastly, or potentially first, depending on how you cross the canal, our void gaze points us to an artifact in this apartment, looking over the dead eels forward operating base. If we go and introduce ourselves, he reveals that he was a personal tailor to the Empress, and to Emily Caldwin. He talks about how much he loved them, how kind they were, and ultimately he curses Corvo's name. This is an impossible to ignore reminder that you're in no small part responsible for what happened to Dunwall. He says that when his hands were too shaky to work the needle, he was given a lock of Emily's hair to remember her by. This is when Delilah visited him. She came to his home, took Emily's lock of hair, and cursed the place with a ritual, creating the rune that led us here in the first place. As I said, you can pass these three landmarks in either direction, but the especially observant player will take note of this pile of junk down here. Heading over, it's revealed that we're in fact looking at a key, some coin, and a wedding ring. The key can get us that gold bar from the other side of the canal, and the wedding ring can be used to nab an extra rune by fulfilling a Granny Rags recipe you might have found near the first area. With that, we've gotten a pretty complete look at what all is out here in this first map. The only mystery left is the password to get into the Hatter's Gang hideout, and why we would want to go there in the first place. So let's go over what we've got so far. The game has given us tricky navigation challenges, ample opportunity to use our new power pool to nab some extra coin. Through our ability to intervene and turn the tide of various gang fights, we've gotten a bit more invested in the war. We've renewed the player's hatred for Delilah, and indeed their hatred for Dowd. 
We've rewarded them for more in-depth exploration, and we've gotten them curious about whatever the Hatters are hiding. This is a hell of a lot to accomplish with just a single, relatively small level. And to do it all with such beautiful, elegant framing? Well, that's why I thought this pair of videos would be worth making in the first place. We're perfectly set up to be excited about continuing on this frankly massive mission. Thankfully, the rest of the maps in this mission are much more linear, so the rest of this section should flow more smoothly than that did. But anyways, the Draper's Ward Riverfront. I won't go into this much detail for the whole video, but I'd like to point out the especially nice framing when you first enter this level. It visualizes the binary choice between combat and stealth in a super elegant way. Anyways, moving forward, we get some intel on Wakefield's location and a note from a Hatter spy, talking about also seeing some mysterious women on the rooftops. The observant player will catch one for themselves, looking out at the dead eel ship, the Undine. She disappears as soon as you look directly at her. There are a couple of ways to knock her out or kill her to get a closer look, but that's obviously not intended, so we'll move on. There are really only a few stops to make in this area, and they're more or less in a straight line, so let's just take it that way. First off, you'll probably wind up looking at this witch because of the bone charm she's left on her perch. So we'll grab that, and one of our assassins informs us that smuggling ships usually have a hatch below deck for dumping contraband. Either way you choose to get into the ship, Edgar Wakefield is ours to do with as we please. Moving forward, we've got a booby-trapped rune to collect, as well as an outsider shrine for the super observant player to find a way to. This building also has a dialogue where an assassin outright tells us that he's been spotting figures blinking away on the rooftops, in case you've missed it before. Narratively, this section is super cool, but in terms of level design, I think it's one of the weaker pieces, just because you don't really need to work too much to have everything handed to you. All of your points of interest are pretty easy to get to without being seen, although I suppose it's just as well, because once you do away with Wakefield and signal Lizzie, the guards here are no longer hostile. Anyways, Lizzie tells us that she can't take us to Delilah yet, because her ship is missing an engine coil. That's what the Hatter stole from the Dead Eel. She also talks a lot about cutting off people's fingers, so yeah, helping her out isn't exactly the morally just thing to do, but it's worth it to stop Delilah. Anyways, we've got a target, the Geezer. We can try to cut a deal with him to get that engine coil back, or we can figure out how to take it by force. Lizzie also managed to snag the password for the Hatter's hideout. Whalebone. Come in, Hatter. As our assassins inform us, the Hatters have been using their textile mill to make shrouds for the plague dead. But that isn't relevant to our goal. We need to see about getting this engine coil, and failing that, we need to talk to the geezer. We hop on this roof and listen to some dialogue while the game gives us a great opportunity to snag some extra loot with pool and then it's as simple as finding a way into the mill. There are all sorts of options, high and low, near and far, but once you're in, you're greeted by some pretty demanding stealth challenges. You'll have to be super careful not to set off traps, and not to accidentally run into someone as you go up and down the stairs, but heading downstairs, we see that our engine coil is behind a padlocked door. Poole won't do the job here, but we find a note saying that Nurse Trimble, the personal doctor to the geezer, knows the code. The main workroom, which leads to the geezer and Trimble, is definitely one of the biggest stealth challenges in the level. You might be tempted to blink up here, but if you're unobservant, that'll put you right into the view of this guard. Either way, once we make it past, we get to meet the geezer himself, and you know what? The level design here isn't really all that interesting. At this point, between these two videos, I've kind of covered almost all of Dishonored's level design tricks. Enemies on the high ground to interrupt your smooth traversal of the level, careful framing in the geometry to guide you through interesting routes, use of runes and bone charms to lead you to extra snippets of lore or intel, bad or dangerous situations that the player can avoid by getting immersed and staying observant. The raw geometry of these levels still has a couple of tricks up its sleeve that I haven't covered, but after going into so much detail over the preceding parts of this video, I can sense you getting bored. No, what's much better at keeping us guessing this far into Dishonored's content is the story, and the choices we're presented with. So, for the most part, we'll be focusing on those from here on out. Fortunately, we're about to cover a very interesting set of choices. My name's Dowd. I'm looking for Lizzie Stride's missing engine coil. We can strike a deal with Nurse Trimble, in which we restore the flow of water, allowing the water wheel to function so that they don't need the engine coil anymore. We can try to find the coil ourselves, dooming their textile mill, which is working to help with plague relief, or we can get the combination to the door from the geezer, who's being kept alive by Trimble. All he wants in exchange is for us to take his life. Those first two are pretty self-explanatory, but that last one? Well, we wouldn't even have to step foot in the sewers, and we'd spare a man from endless torture, but there's a nuance. Trimble has this place wired up to gas everybody in it if the geezer finally buys the farm. 
So long as we make the same antitoxin that Trimble drinks every day, we'll be fine, but all of the Hatters are dead. The Geezer makes it out like this would be a good thing, but again, our assassin told us that they're helping with plague relief. Not a very complicated moral decision, but a moral decision nonetheless. The Geezer doesn't deserve to live like this, but the Hatters don't deserve to die, and killing Trimble isn't a solution either, as he's the only one keeping the Geezer, and by extension everyone in the textile mill, alive. Personally, I'm going to choose the route that lets us see more of the level. We'll strike a deal with Nurse Trimble, get that water flowing again, get our engine coil, and get the hell out. Entering the sewers, there's actually a pretty substantial shortcut that I didn't find until I was replaying the level for this video. It lets us skip the next couple of rooms and get an early grab at some intel that'll completely nullify the challenge of one of them, and get straight to the pump control station. But these are some really interesting rooms, so let's assume you didn't take that shortcut. Firstly, we find a woman calling for help, saying that she broke her leg down here while looking for her son. This is immediately fishy, seeing as she's in such a prominent spot, and seeing as we almost definitely know that Delilah's witches are at play. It's tempting to help her, but we should at least use Void Gaze first and make sure we aren't walking into a trap. And there it is, a witch lying in wait, talking to a statue of Delilah. This is most definitely a trap. Pretty low if you ask me. If they're going to be pulling stunts like this, then we should probably go ahead and get a good look at them. Time for a sleep dart. Roses, plant matter, a black veil, got it. It's good to finally get a close look at one. Of course, you can also fall for this trap and have to fight a couple of witches, particularly difficult enemies. Or hey, you can call her bluff, torture a bit of info out of her, and then knock her out if you've taken some inspiration from Lizzie's style. But anyways, let's go say hi to Delilah and let her know that she won't fool us that easily. So let's go over the intel we got here. I doubt many players would have caught all of this on their first playthroughs. I mean, hell, I didn't even know you could torture this witch until five minutes ago. But she tells us that when Delilah's plan comes to fruition, nobody will even know what's happened, and something about Delilah sitting upon the secret throne. The witch who was talking to Delilah's statue mentions something about the portrait of the girl being nearly complete. Then you might think back to that tailor who made clothes for the dead empress, who Delilah stole a lock of Emily's hair from. At this point, we can start making some very educated guesses as to what Delilah's plan is, but I won't say it outright for now. I just think it's super cool that it's foreshadowed so thoroughly in a way that's so hidden that it'll only be picked up on by the absolute most observant players. For another example of this, if you pay very close attention to the audio log that was left in the interrogation room in Coldridge Prison, you'll note that this witch was arrested while trying to break into Dunwall Tower. Interesting. Moving forward, we get a great little moment where we start using this turn wheel, only to hear Shh, someone's coming. Which of course enables us to bypass this ambush from another pair of witches if you didn't catch them with Void Gaze. Next up, we take down or sneak past these last couple of witches and see that they're in fact the ones who sabotage the pumps in order to provoke this gang war and complicate Dowd's plans, luring him right into their trap. But once we're past all of that, we get yet another reminder of just how dangerous all of this occult stuff can be. This man died while sketching The Outsider Walks Among Us into this table, and jumping over this wall, we see a whole shrine that he's set up, like a man possessed. The Outsider reminds us again of the tightrope that Dowd is walking, but with that, the engine coil is ours, and we can return to Lizzie. I'll admit, working with Trimble makes me feel pretty dirty, but it's better than killing every last hatter. But hey, with Dowd having resolved both sides' conflict with him, the gang war actually ends, at least for now. With that, there's only one loose end to this level. We managed to surpass every ambush from Delilah's Coven, and they needed to stop us at all costs. Now, I'm gonna be a smartass and use the statuesque bone charm to remain invisible to them while standing still, but there are of course a million ways to handle this fight. And with that, it's on to the final mission that was ever released for Dishonored 1. Right off the bat, we're given some useful intel by our assassin. Snares, numerous statues of Delilah in the front yard, and some sort of secret way of getting in and out of the house while the front door remains locked. In exiting this dialogue, only one path is immediately obvious. Up this staircase. One detail that I especially like here is that, during this short, linear section, we pass a dog's skull lying on the ground, and when we enter this ring of blue flowers, it wakes up, and the body of the dog manifests beneath it. Killing the dog won't do, you have to destroy the skull or else it will manifest again. What's cool about this though is that the ring of flowers indicates the exact range we have to be in for the dog to manifest, which will be helpful info in future. Anyways, we move up these stairs and an assassin tells us exactly how to dispatch these dogs in case we didn't figure it out for ourselves. This dialogue also plays if we take the right fork to get on top of this roof, just so that we don't miss this important piece of intel. 
Since the gear up here is part of a dead drop that we can pay for, we're pretty likely to end up here one way or another, and we come across a note that mentions something about a grave switch that's been disabled in preparations for Dowd's arrival. Might be a clue as to how exactly they've been getting in and out. With that intel, we can check out the graveyard to find that this is exactly what we've been looking for. That's how we can get inside. The grave switch is apparently in the garden shed, must be in the backyard. Moving through the greenhouse, we can get there, but now's as good a time as any to cover an alternate means of getting to the backyard. Two of the other favors we can pay for are to have a stash of supplies be dug up by the shoreline, and a hole put in the fence for an easy entry point to the front yard. So let's check out what's over there. We pick up our stash of supplies, as well as a bone charm which may have alternately prompted us to explore over here, and there's our hole in the fence. We run past some river crusts and do a bit of climbing, and the extra observant player will note a hole in the attic up here which can take us straight to the backyard. So we've been presented with what ultimately boils down to two different choices to getting behind the mansion, but since you have to discover these choices yourself, and since there are so many pros and cons to both approaches, it feels super dynamic. Forcing the player to find their own way is the ultimate example of how Dishonored makes more out of less. Anyways, by this point, now that we're in the heart of it all, you start really listening to what these witches are saying, and it starts to become painfully obvious that these aren't the Halloween sort of witches. These are the horrifying kind that make your eyes boil out of your skull and casually talk about rotting flesh and putting hexes on your family. And, well, it's actually some really dark stuff, easily the creepiest stuff in the whole of Dishonored lore. This is some messed up business that Dowd's gotten involved in. If by this point you aren't aching to take down Delilah's coven, I don't know what else can motivate you. Now that we're in the backyard, I get to talk about one other great little detail that really makes you feel like an assassin, planning everything out beforehand in the same way that we felt in the first DLC. The final favor that we can pay for during mission prep is to have a turncoat reveal some secrets to us, a woman in red. We see her teleport away when we get to this roof, and she leads us to a secluded area by the manor's walls. She outright tells us Delilah's plan, she's going to take over Emily's mind so that she can rule as empress. She also confirms to us that we need to get the grave switch from the shed and enter through the crypt. If you don't want to mess with all of these river crusts, you can easily grab the switch using pool. Yet another example of Dishonored making simple powers incredibly useful to players who are willing to think about them. Anyways, there isn't much more to talk about in the backyard. We get a little component for a Granny Rags recipe, but a bit more interestingly, you might have heard these two witches talking about a butler who drowned in the backyard before they arrived here. Investigating his corpse reveals that he has a key to the front door, so you don't necessarily have to use the crypt if you don't want to. We'll use the crypt entrance here, since it's pretty much all the same, but again, there are only two options, but we've gotten so many different ways to get that intel that it really feels much larger than it is. Anyways, if, like me, you tend to gravitate towards high ground in this game, and like to use void gaze when in interiors, you'll probably be led straight to this bone charm, and then straight to Delilah's study, which has been booby-trapped a ludicrous amount. If we're careful, however, we come across this magical lamp and some sketches of Emily. Reading the nearby journal, we see exactly what Delilah's plan is, as well as how we might stop it. She intends to perform a ritual on herself to enter the painting of Emily, thus controlling her mind. She notes that the ritual can be used on any person with any painting. She talks about how she'd like to try imprisoning one of her enemies in a still life, trapping them in a bowl of fruit for eternity. Now all we have to do is find her studio, where we can enter the void and confront her. In this same area, we find an overseer who's been tortured and forced to eat the flesh of one of his peers. By this point, I can't wait to put an end to these witches. Besides all the booby traps, most of this area is actually pretty easy to get through safely, so long as you're stocked up on sleep darts and using void gaze liberally. We've got notes telling us to get the lantern from the west wing in case we missed it, and bone charms or runes pulling us to various points of interest, the usual stuff. Once we get into the East Wing, though, where we need to access Delilah's studio, things are a lot more intense. These witches are everywhere, and there really isn't a lot of cover. If you didn't bring a ton of sleep darts, mana, arc mines, or whatever else, you're gonna have a very tough time dealing with this area. Of course, you can also fight your way through, but these witches are pretty brutal in combat. No, any way you slice it, this is a pretty demanding area. But once we get through and disable a healthy amount of witches, we've pretty much got the run of this place covered. All that's left is to set the lantern in front of Delilah's painting so that we can enter the void and confront her. This is just a fantastic way of ending the game. We've got a simple, binary choice. We swap out Delilah's painting with another one of hers so that she becomes trapped in it, or we challenge her to the most intense boss battle in the game. I would have liked it if we got a separate ending for failing to stop the ritual, given just how many awful things can happen in the base game's endings, but it's no biggie. <laughs> Oh, <laughs>
We all knew that Dowd would be able to stop Delilah. The outsider knew too, but depending on how you played, Dowd did the impossible. I have one more surprise for you. I ask for my life. When I killed your empress and took her daughter, something broke inside me. Now I want nothing but to leave this city and fade from the memory of those who reside here. I've had enough killing. So my life is in your hands. Make your choice. If Dowd went through this game mercilessly killing, not focused on helping to save Dunwall, but instead focusing on pleasing the outsider in some desperate, twisted form of prayer, then he learned nothing, and a bloody end couldn't be more fitting. But if Dowd instead saw the outsider's gift, the name Delilah, as an opportunity to undo a sliver of his evil and didn't help to further the chaos in Dunwall, well, maybe he can still change yet. Dowd managed to stop death himself. Did he deserve to die? Probably. He's responsible for so much death, even before the Empress. But over the course of a low chaos playthrough of these two DLC, all he's done is give Corvo a fighting chance to undo what was done to Dunwall and the Empire. What was done by Dowd. He's the reason the Empire nearly fell apart, and all he did by taking down Delilah was staunch the wound. Dowd sure as hell isn't redeemed. That much is impossible. But Corvo and the Outsider gave him a chance he never should have had. A chance to change his ways. As always, before I close out this video, I'd like to verbally thank my patrons. It's been really rough trying to make up for lost momentum after the holiday season view drought, so more so than ever before, you guys are seriously helping to keep me afloat. I'd especially like to thank the patrons who are donating $10 or more monthly, such as Alex Vander Wood, Almost Dead Again, Anatoly Volnov, Andrew Melnick, Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Benny, Big Time Jim, Bobby Blitz, Colin Gajic, Cosmo Borsky, Daniel Christman, Darius Fazier, David Kaiser, Dominic Johan, Duncan Bristow, Freylum, In Bloom, Jack Eisenberg, Jano, John Strange, Kale Graybill, Mello, Mixer Rules, Money and Muses, Moon, Patio Furniture, Perks 3D, CeeLo, Yemen Shi, Young Master Pig, and Zero Blee.